Good morning, everybody. Okay, go ahead and get started here. I'm Eric Harrison, and we have our weekly cardiac conference that's posted online at cardiacaricritique.com. This is WFLHCA. And uh, our first case today are mystery cases. Uh, and the mystery case for today is SK, who is a 48-year-old female who's a triathlete. She's had two cerebral vascular accidents. The first one was about three years prior to seeing her. She had a small subcortical infarct. It was attributed to estrogens and cigarette smoking. Even though she's a triathlete, she was still a smoker. I think she's a very light smoker. She had negative coag workup. Uh, and uh, the second one occurred, and she had a very aggressive workup. And uh, she apparently both episodes occurred when she was running, which is an interesting point. Uh, involved her left arm in speech, so it was the same neurological distribution. The deficit seemed transient, no residual effects, although MRI showed some abnormalities of the stroke. She had a cardiology consult. She'd had an echocardiogram, and then she had a TEE. And I don't show, know exactly what the echo showed, but I do know, because this was all done elsewhere, but I do know that TEE showed the 0.6 by 0.6 centimeter rounded mass attached to the left coronary cusp of the aortic valve. Patient's uh, cardiologist told the patient or doctor that this was not a problem and that she did not need to do anything about it. Patient denied any other symptoms, internal matter, Internal medicine doctor called me and explained over the phone the problems and asked for a second opinion. And so I gave him a second opinion over the phone based on his description and recommended robotic open heart surgery. And so that wasn't the end of the story because we can't just make diagnosis over the phone. And so she came in and we saw her. She had the two CVAs, ductal cancer in situ which was breast cancer, estrogen positive, progesterone positive, HERS2 positive, received no chemo or radiation, and a chronic acne for which she took antibiotics. She had bilateral mastectomies with reconstructive breast surgery using silicon breast implants, hysterectomy. She uh, quit smoking uh, several years ago after her first stroke on the advice of the physicians. There was a history in the family of hypertension, but she did not have hypertension. She took the uh, aspirin because of the two cerebral vascular accidents uh, and was on ampicillin uh, because of her uh, acne. Physical examination was normal. And uh, the prior TEE, which I don't have, which I did review though, showed again the 6 by 6, 0.6 by 6, rounded mass attached to the left coronary cusp of the aortic valve on the aortic side, uh, and it did not interfere with valve function. There were no other findings seen, no evidence of any other possible cardiac origin of an embolic stroke. Preserved left ventricular systolic function and normal chamber sizes. What to do next? Any uh, Anybody have any suggestions on how to proceed? Well, we always do an EKG, so let's just show the EKG, which was unremarkable, sinus bradycardia. Uh, and this EKG tells me that this is a great candidate for doing a, a coronary CT because of a slow heart rate. So we can get great images. And so we did do a coronary CT. And hold on, and we'll show this to you. And Voila, here's our lesion that we see. Looks like it's at the commissure of the left coronary sinus of Valsalva. And the non-coronary sinus of Valsalva. So it's right there on the uh, right side left side. On the left side, 
These are the bilateral breast prostheses. We can see uh, patient's coronaries very well. Didn't expect coronary artery disease. There's no coronary calcification. So she doesn't have a coronary artery disease. And there's one other finding that she had, and that is this mass uh, on the right side may be attached to the pericardium, or it may be a para-cardiac lesion. And we can see what the Hounsfield units are. Basically, uh, we have to put this on a different, a different mode to be able to tell you Hounsfield units, but um, it looks like it's the same as water when we measured it. And so this would be either a pericardial or pericardial cyst, depending upon whether it's involved in the pericardium or adjacent to the pericardium. So the tumor is quite clearly seen in this particular image. Let's go back to our slide deck. So the CTA showed a mass along the commissure between the non-coronary and coronary cusp, predominantly on the left coronary cusp side, superior aspect of the aortic valve. Normal coronaries, coronary origins, pulmonary veins, left atrium, everything else was normal except for the pericardio, which we don't have here, pericardial cyst or pericardial cyst. And that's another mass seen as well posterior to the heart on the right side. Totally independent of this particular mass in terms of its appearance. Doesn't look like it has anything to do with the breast cancer, does not look like a breast cancer met does not look like anything to do with what we saw on the aortic valve. So the patient was presented with the option for a robotic surgery in North Carolina to remove the mass, or Orlando to remove the two masses. Uh, you'd have to do open heart surgery, minimally invasive, to remove both masses. Um, it did not appear that the pericardial cyst, or pericardial cyst, was significant, but on looking at old studies, it may have gotten larger, because she had a workup when she had her breast cancer, and it was present then, so it may have gotten a little bit larger, so she opted to have both taken out, so she went to Orlando, had open heart surgery, rather than uh, just the robotic surgery, and had removal of both the little tiny mass that was on the aortic valve, as well as the pericardiac cyst turned out to be pericardiac cyst, which uh, basically had very clear solution inside and uh, sometimes called a still water cyst because uh, it looks like spring water. So it's called a still water or spring water cyst. Post-op, uh, she did have a post-cardiotomy syndrome, which is common, probably commoner in young people, and she had an increased ESR. She was treated with non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, and she had some post-op syncope trying to get back probably too fast into being a triathlete. So we did put her on a treadmill, and she ran for 15 minutes, and we did that just for reassurance for her uh, to get her feeling like uh, she was confident to get out and do some running again. So after she won her confidence, she was out doing her triathlete activities again, without any problems. We do have a post-op MRI that we did on her, basically uh, before we go on to the next case, which we did for reassurance again because of her uh, complaint of syncope, near syncope, when she was trying to get back to running uh, and uh, she wasn't really in, in condition for that yet.
So this is an advanced cardiac imaging conference. So we want to get you used to seeing these images when they're normal or when they're abnormal. So this is postoperatively. This is the black blood study, which is used for basically defining the anatomy. And here's a more complete black blood study. This is the aortic valve. This is the left atrium. Left ventricle appears to be normal. Right ventricle is normal. Left atrium, right atrium. Some artifact. These studies are always so pretty that I love to show them. This is a perfusion study. I usually like to dim it out a little bit. And then we look at the myocardium and watch to see if it's homogeneously perfused. Probably a little too dim there. There we go. And there's your perfusion. Contractility, serially, late gadolinium study to look for our scar tissue, of which there's none. So as you get used to looking at these, you'll understand what our goals are each time. And let's show you another ventricular image. And this is a good image because we want to show you that the aortic valve is competent. So postoperatively, there was removal of the tumor, but the aortic valve is competent. You would clearly see if there is any significant aortic regurgitation. And it looks like there's just a tiny, if you look closely, there's just a tiny, tiny little whiff of aortic regurgitation that you can see where I placed this marker. Tiny, tiny little whiff there. And so that will go away in time. And I don't think that was seen on the echocardiogram, but it was seen on this image. Contractility. Sometimes when the pericardial sac has been violated, there will be some decrease in septal motion. It looks pretty good here. So let's go back to our slides for the second case. So case two has a 61-year-old male who basically had some fatigue and chest discomfort and had been seen uh, for an extensive cardiac workup prior to my seeing him, uh, which was negative, except for an abnormal EKG. I can't show his echocardiogram, but there was an echocardiogram done at this time, which was normal with mild to moderate mitral regurgitation, anatomically normal valve, mild pulmonary hypertension, slightly dilated aortic root, left ventricular hypertrophy because he had some hypertension, normal left ventricular ejection fraction, and then he had uh, the SPECT scan, which had normal perfusion. Past history of hiatal hernia, GERD, was exercising on a regular basis, Physical examination was entirely normal. EKG shows left atrial abnormality. The P wave is kind of long. P wave is long. There's a T wave inversion lead one and L. Some ST and T wave changes in V5 and V6, which are nonspecific. 
and the echocardiogram showed a small pedunculated mass attached to the interventricular septum. It, it was below the aortic valve, somewhat heterogeneous in terms of tissue interrogation, had some blood flow motion, did not prolapse into the aortic orifice, some mild microgurgitation, borderline left ventricular hypertrophy versus athletic heart. And we will show you the CTA images. Hang on. So this is uh, our 3D volume rendered image. It shows a normal coronary distribution. The dominant right coronary. Let's go take a look at the axial images. And we're looking at the left ventricle, left ventricular outflow track. Aortic valve looks beautiful. Coronary origins are normal. Left ventricle might be a little thick. Left atrium looks okay. Left atrial appendage looks normal. And so here is our lesion. Tiny little thing, but distinguishes itself quite well on the echocardiogram because it's got motion. And so we're on that right there. Hounsfield units, 182. Contrast, 400. 182, Hounsfield units, 51, 83, 96, and then we come down here, 186. So a uh, different tissue density than myocardium. Very vague looking. You might not have seen it if you weren't looking for it. So but instead of doing a cardiac cath, we've got a nice illustration of the coronaries. We didn't take the risk of having a catheter fall across the aortic valve while injecting the left coronary or the right coronary. Usually it happens in the right coronary. We didn't take the risk of catheter dropping across the valve and uh, perhaps uh, rubbing against this. And so patient is asymptomatic, serendipitous finding, surprise to him, surprise to everybody. He was shocked when we told him that you have this small tumor and it will have to come out. Called his wife to come over to talk about that. Come in for a routine echo and then you're told you have to have some surgery. So lesion in the left ventricular outflow tract seen vaguely with gross anatomy of the study. Normal coronaries, no evidence of pulmonary emboli. Calcium score zero. What to do next? And usually we do sort of overkill non-invasively when we see these patients. We don't do the TEE because I think the CMR replaces the TME quite nice. The TEE is quite nicely. So we don't do a TEE, we don't do a cardiac cath, and we prefer minimally invasive surgery. So the surgeon likes to have as much information as we can give him, and since we decide not to do the TEE, which is invasive, we do the MRI instead. So we'll show you the MRI. So let's take a look at the MRI and see what we can glean from that. And it looks like normal left ventricular contractility. It looks like a high quality study. If you can see the cordy tendony coming off of the papillary muscles and extending to the mitral valve, you've got a great study. So we see these two papillary muscles and the cords coming off of them. There's mitral competence. See the ascending aorta. Really pretty study. More sequential images.
This is our four chamber view, which nicely shows mitral valve, tricuspid valve, left ventricle, right ventricle, left atrium, right atrium, interatrial septum, pulmonary veins, descending aorta, pericardium. That's a beautiful study. Some measurements we took. This is look at the right side where you can see the superior vena cava emptying into the right atrium. The inferior vena cava, tricuspid valve, right ventricular contractility, and then the aorta is superimposed up here. More measurements. You might be able to see the tumor perhaps there, but we need to find the left ventricular outflow tract study. There's a perfusion study. Shows a normal myocardial perfusion. That's a look locker. I hope you're not getting dizzy on that one. Let's go over here and Again, showing all anatomical structures. I'm looking for that particular outflow track. This. Maybe it's up here. Oh, here we go. This is almost a left ventricular outflow track. I can't see the tumor on this image. I'll find it on another image. All right, we've got a moving image, left ventricular outflow track, and there's our tumor swinging in the breeze. Little tiny guy, right exactly where we saw it before on the cardiac CT. So it's right in this little bump of the septum, and it's hanging down, sort of pedunculated, and swinging forward during systole, and back during diastole. Mitral valve seems to sort of maybe touch it during diastole. We can magnify this a little bit. There we go. Now, oh, there it is. You can see it swinging right there. So let's go back to our PowerPoint. I think we've got enough information to satisfy the surgeon for robotic aortic valve uh, transaortic valve removal. And so the patient did go to North Carolina and to Dr. Chitwood to Pitt County Hospital. And uh, he had the procedure. And actually, they uh, streamed the procedure to us so that we could watch it and watch the surgery. And you can see Dr. Chitwood basically crossing the aortic valve and sort of opening up, stretching the aortic valve open to be able to see underneath there, and then excising the tumor off of the septum 
and then coming back out from the aortic valve and then doing a TEE to show that the aortic valve leaked uh, ever so slightly postoperatively. Patient uh, tolerated the procedure very, very well. He was very excited that it was going to be just robotic surgery and that uh, he had the promise of being able to probably go home after three or four days and go across the street to the Marriott where Dr. Chidwood and his staff would then make rounds at the Marriott on uh, day four and day five and then he'd head home. So he did have post-op a trace aortic regurgitation, saw for a while in the echo and then it went away and wasn't present anymore. He still comes back to get echoes uh, once a year and uh, we've seen no signs of recurrence of the tumor. He did very well. He was on amiodarone for a while and then we stopped that uh, and uh, he had a benign postoperative course. And now we're going to show you case number three who was a 57 year old male who presented to our office for a review of his cardiac imaging results and he had had a uh, transthoracic echo and uh, basically uh, he had a prior history of a neurological event, right facial numbness that spread to the rest of his body on the right side while watching TV. Watching TV, he presented to the ER, CT of the head and brain didn't show anything. TE showed the aortic valvular size of a P mass attached to the aortic valve leaflet, very similar to what we saw before. He had some mild carotid placking. He recovered from uh, the neurological insult without having any sequelae. Had a history of hypertension, right bundle branch block, otitis media, vasectomy. Was a smoker for 30 years. Was on Diavan, HCTZ, atorvastatin, aspirin. Physical examination was unremarkable. His EKG shows the right bundle branch block. No other abnormalities. So a benign right bundle branch block. What to do next? And of course, we would elect to do the coronary CT. The advantages being that you're not going to be in the coronary sinus with a catheter like you would uh, with cardiac cath, which would present some risk of bumping against this thing uh, with a catheter, uh, so that uh, this would be uh, certainly I'll go along with our dictum of first do no harm. And so we did do the coronary CT. We don't have the disc delivered to us. Uh, it has been requested, so the images aren't available. Basically, it's it was ideal for this patient because we wouldn't be bumping against the mass. Showed normal coronaries. Showed a 1.1 by 0.9 centimeter nodule in the left ventricular outflow tract attached to the aortic valve. No calcification present in the nodule. Non-obstructive coronary artery disease. Mild atherosclerosis involving this descending aorta. Mild LVH. And then poor contrast to pacification of the left atrium. And of course, you're always looking for patients who have cryptogenic strokes, who have episodic atrial fibrillation, which occurs about 30% of the time in cryptogenic strokes in older people. And so, so you're always looking for a stunned left atrium from somebody who's converted from atrial fib to sinus, or perhaps a, a clot in the left atrial appendage. But I think this was related to low flow in the left atrial appendage and not to a thrombus it would be basically a false positive which we see all the time also. If you don't have atrial fibrillation you're unlikely to have a left atrial appendage clot but if you have transient atrial fibrillation it can happen. So the patient was advised to undergo robotic surgery at Dr. Chitwood's place, Pitt County Hospital, University Associated Program underwent the surgery, tolerated the procedure well, had no complications. Came back to Tampa. His vocation as well as his avocation is making fly rods. He uh, goes to uh, many of the street fairs and sells fly rods and so he was back into making his fly rods which is a sedentary activity. And so I thought I'd talk about our experiences and tell you what we're talking about here. And so we're, re we're going to reveal that 
these patients all have cardiac papillary fibroelastoma, sometimes known as PFE or sometimes known as CPF. And so these are the cases that I've experienced. The first case that I experienced was in 2010. It was a lady who was about 60 years old, again, had neurological events, had a serendipitous pickup of a mass on the aortic valve. This one had cardiac cath at that time because we weren't doing, so the first one had cardiac cath, uh, here's the first one down here, 2002, had cardiac cath and open heart surgery because we weren't doing CTA. The cases we presented today uh, had CTA and open heart surgery, which was the first one because of the pericardiac cyst, so we had to have a more extensive procedure other than robotic. The second one had robotic surgery in CT, which is the most non-invasive. The third one had robotic surgery in CT and also CMR. And so these patients uh, did well, all of them. Uh, the differential diagnosis from papillary fibroelastoma uh, is something called Labra's Lambel's excrescences, which we'll show you some in a minute. And we had two cases that were referred to as to rule out papillary fibroelastoma. We have myxomas all the time, and the surgeon who did case number one thought that the tumor was a myxoma, but it wasn't. He even thought postoperatively it was a myxoma, but it wasn't. And the myxomas, we've had three right atrial myxomas. One was in a 15-year-old girl who was diagnosed as having pulmonary emboli, and actually the myxoma was in the right atrium, going into the right ventricle, and then streaming into the pulmonary artery, and actually getting pulmonary emboli. And so they were, the diagnosis pulmonary embolus was correct, but it wasn't pulmonary embolus from clots, it was pulmonary embolus from myxoma. We had one right ventricular, one left ventricular, six left atrium, the first case I saw was a 30-year-old lady in 1971 who was uh, and then uh, cardiac surgery was very primitive at Tampa General and that patient uh, had the tumor removed but died postoperatively of postoperative complications. Those are the days when surgeons would do one case a week and they didn't, didn't have a really good team or good organization. And then we've had uh, one patient who had a lipoma it was not lipomatous hypertrophy of the inner atrial septum. It was a discrete lipoma, which we'll show you one day, that was between the papillary muscles and the left ventricle. So that's been a sort of our experience with cardiac tumors. Not a lot over a period of time. Uh, and all benign except for the malignancy that they can embolize and you can have a fatal stroke. Or you can embolize and to the coronary and have a uh, acute myocardial infarction. So this is an example of one of the Lambel's excrescents, which are called valvular strands, and it's seen uh, better when there's cardiac wall motion because then you'll see this moving up and down and just sort of streaming uh, as it moves up and down. And it's just a streamer. It's not uh, a discrete pea-like mass. It's more like a streamer. So that's easy to distinguish between that and uh, papillary fibroelastomas, PFEs. Cardiac papillary fibroelastoma is a primary cardiac neoplasm that's increasingly detected by echocardiography. It's just an incidental finding in the workup of cryptogenic stroke. It's no longer cryptogenic than when you find that. The clinical manifestations are usually neurological, not uh, that of peripheral emboli to the extremities, but neurological. Uh, the mean age of the patient is usually around 60. 46% uh, were males, so most are females. The size is about 9 millimeters. 82.7% occurred on the valves, mostly aortic. 43% were mobile. 91% are single, so you can't have multiple. 23 of 26 patients uh, had it confirmed by pathological examination. And uh, the symptoms then could be attributed to embolization. There's a potential for serious morbidity, especially with large mobile left-sided lesions. Right-sided lesions can cause pulmonary emboli, but they would be minor and would be very small. 
I'm not sure if you saw it on the right side that you would take it out. The presence of tumor should be determined in patients with symptomatic, unexplained cardiac or neurological events. So to, again, it's uh, some uh, part of the workup and part of the differential diagnosis of cryptogenic stroke. Consideration for surgical decision should be given to those patients, whether asymptomatic or symptomatic, if it's on the left side, because there's a high cumulative risk, as you saw from these patients, of having embolization and uh, also having uh, strokes uh, and TIAs. And the surgical risk is very low nowadays, especially with robotic surgery. And you see that the workup is all non-invasive. And here's a picture of characteristic transesophageal echo lesion uh, on the aortic valve in the center. I've seen lots of these that look like that. And then here's a section showing that uh, it's somewhat uh, papillary. It's got these fingers that are like fins that are reaching out. See that one? It looks like a fern when you look at it under the microscope. It's a fibrillary. Fibrillar, fibrillar, it's a vascular connective tissue core, a looser matrix, and these fronds that are covered by endothelium. So it's unlikely for a wall to get thrombus on it because it's endothelialized. But uh, somehow little pieces of this might break off, and you can see how it's kind of broken up from just from making the slide or maybe from removing the tumor. And here's a uh, h and &E showing the mucopolysaccharide matrix with the oliform projections. It's got all these little frond-like things. And here's one observed looking uh, through the aortic valve from above and seeing uh, where the tumor is hanging uh, prior to removal. Visualization with robotic surgery uh, is extremely well done. And with current scopes that we have, the pictures are, are immensely better than what you can actually see with direct visualization uh, doing direct surgery. And so because of the magnification and uh, the superb images and superb light that's seen during robotic surgery, the pictures are beautiful and the excision can be done by experienced hands very well. And so this is something because you say, well, it looks like a P, and so there it is. It looks like a P, but hey, it also looks kind of like milkweed that's bursting out uh, with a seed pod. And so here's like a seed pod and milkweed bursting out the seeds. Here's how frondular it is. Here it is again with all these little fibrils. And so which is it? Is it P-like or is it like fuzzy? So let's look and see. Here's how you solve the problem. Well, there it is. It's pea-like. Then it's got these things. But wait a minute. You stick it in water, and oh, look. It's frond-like, and it's fuzzy. So it's a little bit of both. And so when we have the specimen out, uh, the fronds collapse. And uh, it doesn't look as much like it does here. So look. This is the waist. This is the waist. Uh, these are fronds that go out this way. These are fronds that go out this way this way and this way, it looks really pretty. Uh, and so you can see what it really looks like. The blue background enhances it quite a bit. And so you got to put it in water to see what it really looks like in the bloodstream. So it looks like a troll. It looks like a vintage naked troll doll. See the fibrils and so on. And so it looks very similar. And so that's basically our presentation today. And uh, the tumor experience that we've had uh, has involved these tumors quite often. About half the tumors we see are myxomas, and the other half are these. And you can see how easily someone can describe a little pea-like thing on the aortic valve over the phone, and you would immediately make the diagnosis, because that's what it looks like, not really what it looks like when it's taken out. certainly doesn't look like a giant lambo's essence certainly doesn't look like what we've seen in the way of myxomas that we've demonstrated here on one of our previous cases. certainly looks like this is well adapted for advanced cardiac imaging. You don't have to do anything invasive. A lot of people still do TEEs, but 
cardiac MRI is preferred from, by me and looks just as good. Cardiac CT takes care of the coronary arteries and you don't have to put a catheter in and mess around the tumor and take the risk of knocking something off. You can see most tumors are benign that we see, sometimes metastatic, uh, but the benign tumors that we've seen certainly present with what could be a malignant course in terms of have young people having an embolic episode. And so if there's any questions, we'll certainly be glad to take questions at this time. Anybody have any questions from Largo? Any questions from anyone? Well, thank you for coming to our conference to see what we think is a, a great display of some of our experiences with cardiac tumors at our imaging center and to give you an opportunity to, to have the same experience that I've had over these years. And you can see uh, how common these tumors are over a period of time at a regional referral center. Thank you so much, and we'll see you next week. Bye-bye.